Yo, what is going on YouTube? It is your boy Cheesy TV. We are back with the series You. We are doing two episode reviews today. Yes, we are doing a double up upload for a TV show in the first time on this channel in a long ass time. So strap in boys. We got a lot boys and girls. We have a lot to talk about with this series. A lot has gone down in these next two episodes. We're even watching another one coming up tonight. So let's just kind of have a big discussion and then that'll be the video. So is it any surprise that Joe is even more irrational and irritating now that he's Beck's stalker boyfriend than he was when he was just her stalker? They have this cozy routine where he watches her sleep and then smells her underwear when she th he thinks she isn't looking. But I guess Beck has forgotten the totally reasonable point she made not that long ago about how she's never met any of his friends. Because rather than press him on his monastic lifestyle, she's trying pathetically to bring Joe into her friend group and he she's not even concerned about his friend group. It's a very weird, weird one. We, we're, we're super, like, in the in the mystery about Joe still. We still don't really know who he is. We know more about Beck than we do him. And he's the protagonist. He's the one that does the voiceovers most of the time. So, temporarily setting aside every problematic thing about this relationship that is Joe's fault, like how he is a homicidal scumbag who has been lying to Beck from the jump and is still reading all of her text messages through her old phone... Um, I would just say that it is so obnoxious of Beck to bring her boyfriend to her girls' night watch watch party of The Bachelor. Almost as obnoxious as it is for Joe to ask AK a voiceover why self-respecting women tolerate this crap. Joe also judges Beck's friends for drinking skinny girl cocktails. I mean, your girlfriend is thin. I don't know why you're being so judgmental about it. You don't get a trash woman who opt for low-calorie beverages or who, who's on a diet. Like... You're with a fit woman. What what the hell is your problem here? But uh, Joe thinks Peach has it out for him. He is absolutely correct. These two have had a long, long rivalry ever since they met each other on this show. And that if I just keep being the perfect boyfriend, Beck will choose him over Peach. Which is wrong. Because Peach and Beck have been lifelong friends. And you're not going to get in between that. And yeah, Peach is wrong at times. And very morally wrong. But you're not going to get between their friendship like that's just not going to happen so yeah uh being cold distant and sporadically unavailable would be so much more appealing to a beck kind of girl um there's a reason uh yeah there's a reason you know they she ditched him for peach or whatever uh but this is not this isn't joe's way this is not how he's going to do it I love that Annika just swoops into Mr. Mooney's wearing a velvet ankle-length robe and shouting, this place is musty at a bookstore. Uh, she chirps about her rates per Instagram. I get $12,000 for a selfie and glasses and graciously offers to give Mooney s some free PR. Oh, well, I have a nice little following here. Let me do you a favor as a friend and give this library some life or some shit. Like... Joe's take on Annika's career as a body-positive social media star... It would be genuinely empowering if it weren't so clearly a rebellion against being Peach's fat friend from prep school. Because, you know, she's still a pretty big person. Um, then Joe spots a picture on Annika's phone of the girls that features a pre-nose job Peach. It's almost as captivating as Shay Mitchell's postmodern look, I guess. I don't know. And encourages Annika to post it as a hashtag TBT to kind of like finesse and to kind of like... He's not, like, forcing her to do it, but it's kind of fucking funny that she actually does it. It's like, oh, well, it's cute. And she doesn't realize, like, the underlying message, the underlying reason why Joe's having her do this. So it creates a kind of funny moment in the show. Um, he even crafts her a caption, bitches being our most authentic selves. It's kind of fucking funny. Joe's awesome. I mean, he's, a, like, he's not really a people person, but he understands people a lot. So, Yeah. High off that sad little victory, Joe gets wildly overdressed for the cheesiest date imaginable. It involves a horse-drawn carriage, while Beck, who always looks like she just blindly threw on whatever some random girl left on the floor of a of a dressing room, has to cancel because Annika is having a breakdown. Obviously, uh, she posted that picture about Peach, unknowing that, you know, <laughs> being their authentic self was just such a funny line. Unknowing that it was exposing Peach for getting a fucking nose job. So now Peach is going out and ruining her social media career by posting this kind of racist video she had back when she was blacked out drunk, you know, bringing cancel culture into this. And obviously the show came out back in 2018. That was about the time they started making these episodes. And cancel culture honestly wasn't that big, as big, until, you know, like 
pandemic times where people were chronically online all day. But, um, yeah, um, someone whose name rhymes with iconic American novelist J.D. Salinger anonymously posted this old video of a drunk Annika spewing some casual racism, and her followers and sponsors are all abandoning her. You know, they're being soft. It's, it's, it's fucking funny. Um, yeah, it is funny, like, the burner account, too. And, obviously, Joe picks up on it. Beck, Beck and Annika aren't able to. So, yeah, um... But in positive news, and what I have to say is a miracle considering Beck has produced exactly one good story under her new advisor's guidance, said, said advisor offers to hook Beck up with an agent who can help her get some paying jobs writing personal essays and reviews. She can actually like make it in the industry for once and actually get a job here and be important, you know. Ecstatic, obviously, Beck reports back to Peach who gracefully nags her so she can take charge of this situation dangling the offer of a meeting with very important agent Roger Stevens. So in the world of you, all the women have hilariously unlikely names, and all the men have names like Joe, Ron, and Roger Stevens. Like, oh, I'm Peach. I'm Guinevere. I'm Annika. Like, what What the fuck? That is a pattern you're starting to notice, and I don't know if that's purposefully done by the show creators, but they do kind of do that, and I think it's kind of funny. It might be a little sexist if, like, the people in the writing room are all males, but... It might be a little stereotypical as well, but hey. So, yeah, obviously Peach doesn't want her to do this because she wants to manipulate her and she wants to, you know, make sure she doesn't get away from her, get any freedom, get any power over her, nothing like that. So Peach knows Roger from when he was a counselor at my Jew camp, I guess, and, and now I have even more questions about how Peach is supposed to be related to J.D. Salinger. Anyway, Peach is throwing a party at Joe's bookstore so Beck can meet this Roger fellow because that's super necessary. Yeah, Joe closed down the library for the night, and of course Joe's going to do it because it's an, an endeavor for Beck. It helps her out, or at least he thinks, but yeah. Joe realizes he's underestimated Peach, who calls him Joseph, which makes him even more insane than he already is, and I really appreciate that. So he starts stalking her too. He really, really just starts digging into her personal life. Um, or, I mean, he, he tries to. He can't do that as well as with Beck. Um, I like this little injection of realism to the what-the-fuck world that is you. Just because you've decided to do recon on your enemy doesn't mean you're magically fit enough to chase them down on their morning run. I mean, there could have been some plot convenience. They could have easily had this man become a fucking track star overnight. But, no, they didn't. I will give Joe points for his disgust at Peach's interior design stylings. Gauche? Demented? If this is the fruit of Peach's imagination, there's no telling what horror she's capable of. Nice little punchline there. I don't know if that was purposefully done either. Um, Joe returns home and I... It's so funny at this, uh, you know, at the side of the stairwell urchin reading Wuthering Heights, which, like, like, once you find out what it's about, it's, like, super fucking... I don't know. I don't know. It turns out he has... He was secret reading material under that cover. Juvenilia, the prosecution of minors in New York State. Obviously, this Dickinson squalor teen would be looking this up on the internet, but I, I don't know. <laughs> it's very concerning. Like, Paco seems to be going through something weird here. But um, anyway, Joe insists that taking a swing at Ron or the, the no-duh next step, alerting child services, will only result in this basically an orphan becoming actually an orphan who bounces around a broken system until he ages out, at which point he will also be broken and his life will have no meaning or worth. I mean, obviously, you know, instinct-wise, instinctively, you would want to go to child services, but it's understandable why Joe wouldn't want to steer him in that direction because, hey orphanages are, aren't always good for everyone. So, Joe's prescription, the Count of Monte Cristo. It is, Joe assures him, about revenge, and more importantly, living with the enemy. So he's kind of giving him some philosophical, philosophical pieces rather than, oh, like, how do I fucking frame my dad against me? Or frame myself against my dad, or whatever, however you say it. So time for the swanky party. Um, Beck, as is her standard practice, is underdressed and self-conscious about it, even though this party was thrown for the express purpose of faci facilitating her introduction to a literary agent, and she kind of just asked Peach to borrow a dress, of course, because, you know, Peach set the whole thing up. It was kind of Peach's choice, but whatever. Joe gives her a very good pep talk, I must admit, and off she goes into the waiting arms of Roger Stevens, the kind of guy who audibly moi, so there's kind of that. You learn very quickly what kind of person this guy is. 
So, while Roger charms back, Peach just trashes Joe for working in the pale and flaccid book business. You know, you, the power accessories, you know. Um, a series of extremely improbable things happen next involving Peach's possessions. For one thing, I don't believe she would bring her laptop to this party. I don't believe she keeps a handwritten food diary. She would for sure be keeping that on her phone, because we're very digital nowadays. I don't believe Joe could take Peach's laptop and then move it across the city to and from her bag and apartment and his apartment, as he proceeds to do for the rest of the episode, without getting caught. Again, this is where maybe some plot convenience, maybe some fantastical aspects of the show start to come in. Um, and I would like to believe that upon finding an old Polaroid of his girlfriend in a cherry print bikini, Joe would not drop everything to jerk off in the torture cage where he murdered Benji not even three episodes ago. Like, what the fuck is going on? But here we are, all of us together, and each one of these things does happen. I mean, what a world, what a universe this, this TV show is creating for us. So... Yeah, man, this is crazy. There's a lot to talk about still. But, uh, when Joe emerges, um there um for the basement he overhears a laughably indiscreet peach tell roger that beck's more of a work in progress and to be gentle when he rejects her she knows he's gonna reject her which is fucking insanity but uh back at beck's place peach is tear tearing through all the drawers because her laptop is missing and her spidey sense is tingling she knows joe took it beck's reaction is basically well what the fuck how am i gonna get involved i don't know jack shit about your laptop so I already found Beck grating, but I see now that our heroine has an interesting condition. When a female character is aggressively unremarkable, but somehow everyone else in the story is infatuated with her and fights over her constantly. Um, we can all agree, you know, she's a pretty lame character. Her interests are like the laundry, pretty much. We are to believe that no one is immune to Beck's charms and that every guy and most women who meet her can't contain themselves. They just have to have her. As Blith might ask, does the character we've met really support that narrative? Anyway, Joe managed to get Peach's laptop back to her house or close enough to it that the Find My Computer GPS sends Peach home with her tail between her legs, but not before she allows for the possibility that an ex is creeping on her. Let's just say that James Franco and I didn't end well, uh, and that while he still had it, Joe found out that one, her password is Beckalicious, and two, Beck, Peach is obsessed with Beck and presumably in love with her but forbidden from being with her because I guess her rich family won't let her be with a woman or because Beck is poor and they're a very classist family. This is to not totally explained but no matter, Joe is quite distraught and he doesn't really know what to do all the way. Um, so after Peach leaves, Joe word vomits everything he heard Peach and Roger say right at Beck, who, as we know, has the emotional resilience of a two-year-old. She runs away in a rage, straight into Roger's waiting limo, where their meeting is to take place. And look, I don't mean to fail you as a professional, as a uh, TV show reviewer, but I am not going to bother to detail what happened in this limo, because these is the exact same scene that played out with Beck and Professor Pervy. Right down to the knee touching and the whoops that I say I read your stuff. I didn't really. And what I did read wasn't that special. It's pretty much a mirror image. This show pretty much stole exactly every detail from that scene. So the best part of this is when Beck confronts Peach. And Peach's way of saying she had no idea Roger would do that is, I mean, he's been clean since 9-11. Beck, when it happened, he was in an airport. Are the best lines of this program wasted on Peach? I guess. I don't know. That's up to you guys. Joe has only one friend left in the world, but even the hallway Moppet is pissed at him t him today. He's very angry about the Count of Monte Cristo because it suggests a person wait at least a decade before exacting a complicated and elaborate revenge. And meanwhile, Ma Ron is throwing Mom against the wall right this instant. He needs <laughs> he needs urgent action. <laughs> and it's kind of funny how he reacts to it. So Beck comes back to Joe's place to do a sad doorway lean and apologize. Just as things are getting cozy, a call comes in from Peach, who took a bunch of pills but does not want to call 911, which should be your first tip that Peach probably took, like, four per cassette and a handful of Tic Tacs just to get Beck's attention. I mean, you already kind of see the fucking signs right there. Like, she's faking shit. So... It works. Uh, Peach begs Pete Beck to stay the night, and after what feels like maybe product placement for Meloxicam, is that a thing people must just have laying around their medical cabinets? Joe is exiled, left to his softcore fantasies of his only love, making out in her underwear with his only hate. Joe understands his only option is to do a murder. 
and not even a well-thought-out murder that involves staging a fake suicide at Peach's apartment. Has no one watched uh, any other TV shows here? I mean, also, Peach literally just acted out this fake almost suicide. It, it would be perfect. No, not that I am encouraging. I'm just saying, if you're going to do this, do it right. Don't do what Joe does, which is spurn it behind Peach as he runs under a bridge and bash her head in with a rock, and then don't even check to make sure she's not breathing. Just run away and trick the rock with all your fingerprints and her blood on it right off the path where it can easily be found. Peach, as Joe will soon discover, survives this amateur non-assassination. Wonder what she'll remember when she comes She comes to in the ER. When Joe gets home, he finds this his saddest little neighbor tried to kill Ron. Should he call 911? No. If you ever want to see your mother again, Joe helps Ron regain consciousness through the power of making him vomit, and to say thank you, Ron pummels Joe's face in. On the bright side, this is a great alibi for the whole Peach situation. So, yeah, that's really it. I'm going to get out of here because this was already a really, really long review, and yeah, I'm sorry, I yap a lot. You guys have complained on the channel plenty of times. I'm reading my notes here. But yeah, um, we're going to talk about the next episode very, very soon, and literally today, we're, we're scheduled to release that video today, but yeah, the whole cliffhanger, I've already watched the next episode, the whole cliffhanger is the whole tried to attempt to murder Peach thing, so that's kind of what we're left off with. I'm out, guys. Peace.